Welcome to the Post-Acute COVID-19 Exercise and Rehabilitation Project. Today's title is It Takes Two, Coupling of Respiratory and Pelvic Diaphragms to Optimize Breathing. This course is intended for educational purposes and does not replace mentorship or consultation with more experienced cardiopulmonary acute care and pelvic health colleagues. This content is current at the time of dissemination. However, realize that evidence and science on COVID-19 is revolving rapidly and information is subject to change. Dr. Snowden and myself feel passionately about sharing knowledge regarding the interplay between the respiratory and pelvic diaphragms. We are honored to have been invited by the cardiovascular and pulmonary section to present on this topic. I have no disclosures, and Dr. Snowden discloses her co-ownership of Snowden and Lido's LLC, which is unrelated to content in this educational activity. Before continuing, we would like to thank our colleagues on the front lines. Please know that we greatly appreciate you and we support you. Please continue to stay safe. These are our objectives. And we're gonna get started looking at the risk factors of COVID-19. Risk factors for COVID-19 include age, specifically greater than 65 years old, comorbidities such as diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, lung disease such as COPD and asthma, and obesity. There are also environmental risk factors such as living in a nursing home or a long-term care facility, sex, with males have compromised a disproportionately higher number of deaths in cohorts from China, Italy, and the United States, and race. Risk factors for pelvic floor dysfunction include age, comorbidities such as cancer with resultant radiation to the genitourinary system, lung diseases such as COPD or cystic fibrosis, and obesity. Additionally, sex can also be a risk factor for pelvic floor dysfunction. While they may be risk factors through different mechanisms, you can see that there are overlaps between the risk factors for COVID-19 and pelvic floor dysfunction. Therefore, with an increase in COVID-19 prevalence, we hypothesize that there will be an increase in individuals with pelvic floor dysfunction. So looking at the disease spectrum, if an individual tests positive for COVID-19, he or she may present anywhere along the disease progression. For today's webinar, we are focusing on individuals who have greater disease involvement. For these individuals, current medical treatments may, inc may include supplemental oxygen, pharmacological interventions, bed rest, and various lines, tubes, and drains for different reasons. These interventions, the critical disease process, and inactivity of the neuromuscular system make patients susceptible to the development of ICU-acquired weakness. ICU-acquired weakness is defined as a syndrome of generalized limb weakness that develops while the patient is critically ill and for which there is no alternative explanation other than the critical illness itself. Going off of ARDS data or acute respiratory disease data, ICU-acquired weakness occurs in 33% of all patients on ventilators, 50% of all patients admitted with sepsis, and up to 50% of all patients who stay in the ICU greater than one week. I say these because this, these descriptors could apply to our patients with COVID-19. As a result of the multi-system involvement, these patients may go on to develop PICS. PICS is a syndrome of disability that remains in those who survive their critical illness. It has cognitive, psychological, and physical components. For more information on ICU-acquired weakness and PICS, we encourage you to watch a PACER webinar presented by Patricia Otaki, James Smith, and Haley Zalesnik. In addition to screening, assessing, and treating PICS, PTs and PTAs will need to screen for signs and symptoms of stroke, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and how breathing through a mask affects the patient's mobility. 
We bring up these points because these post COVID-19 considerations have the potential to influence muscle strength and pressure regulation as we will discuss shortly. So fellow clinicians, we truly feel that this is our time to shine even brighter. We have the ability to assess and treat a variety of symptoms across multiple systems. For further information on specific sy systems, we encourage you to check out these PACER project webinars by our esteemed colleagues. Please know though that this is not a comprehensive list. With this said, today's webinar will focus on the genitourinary system. Now you may be asking yourself why the GU system matters. So let's begin with an overview of breathing and how the pelvic floor contributes. COVID-19 is a hypoxemic disease. Without oxygen in the blood, the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve is going to shift left and our patients will hemodynamically tank, especially during activity. As a result, we need to promote efficient and effective breathing. Looking at inhalation, the diaphragm is our primary inspiratory muscle. The diaphragm contracts and descends, increasing space in the thoracic cavity. This creates negative pressure, allowing oxygen to enter the alveoli. Effort is dependent on elasticity, resistance, and inertial components of the respiratory system. During the second half of the respiratory phase, respiratory cycle, we have exhalation. Expiration is the opposite. The diaphragm relaxes, and when it does, it rises and decreases space in the thoracic cavity. This creates a positive pressure and allows expiration of carbon dioxide. So looking at the diaphragm, it acts as the primary respiratory muscle. The diaphragm also divides the thoracic and abdominal pelvic cavities. Therefore, if the diaphragm is the ceiling of the abdominal pelvic cavity, the pelvic floor muscles are the floor. The pelvic floor muscles are a group of muscles that sling from the pubic bone to the coccyx. Essentially, the pelvic floor muscles make up the pelvic diaphragm. You can see that the pelvic diaphragm is symmetrically aligned with the respiratory diaphragm and acts as the inferior aspect of the core. Consider the pelvic floor muscles as a hammock. One of the purposes of the hammock is to support the organs of the body. You can see in this analogy, the pelvic floor supports the bladder, the uterus, and the rectum. The pelvic floor also assists with pressure regulation. So this provides a superficial overview of how the two diaphragms work together. Know that normally when um, both diaphragms should descend during inspiration, and both should ascend during expiration. Essentially, anything that happens with one diaphragm influences the other. So let's put it all together. While there are many models, we are choosing to demonstrate the link between the respiratory and pelvic floor diaphragm using Mary Massery's soda can model. The aluminum shell of a soda can is thin and inherently weak. Yet when unopened, it remains strong. It is challenging to change an unopened can shape unless the exterior shell is punctured. When the can has a leak, it loses its strength and is easily crushed. Therefore, it is the internal pressure from carbonation which gives the can its strength and form. We can carry these principles over to the human body. Think of the skeleton. The skeleton is weak. Without muscular contractions assisting to maintain and regulate pressure, the skeleton would collapse and lose its shape or posture, if you will. So putting the two together, the trunk is composed of two chambers, the thoracic and abdominal pelvic. It is divided by the respiratory diaphragm. The thoracic cavity is sealed at the top by the vocal cords. The abdominopelvic cavity is sealed at the bottom by the pelvic floor. 
Each chamber is capable of creating and distributing different internal pressures. However, they work together to allow a patient to breathe, to be upright, and to move. Isn't this the goal for all of our patients, regardless of diagnosis and practice setting? Most of our patients, especially post-COVID-19, may not come to us with an intact soda can. So let's consider a disruption or a puncture, if you will. Our patients with COVID-19, specifically those at the severe end of the disease spectrum, may, may have required more invasive treatments, such as an endotracheal tube. An endotracheal tube passes through the vocal cords. Now, typically the vocal cords open and close, similar to how a window does, to allow the passage of air for a patient to vocalize. When the vocal cords have not been used for an extended period of time, they may assume an abducted position, allowing passage of air and disruption of pressure regulation in both chambers. The result of the disruption could be altered breathing mechanics, and altered posture, which requires other trunk muscles, including the pelvic floor, to work over time. Now let's consider patients who may have had a urinary and or fecal catheter. This could disrupt the pelvic floor's strength, again, impairing pressure regulation and leading to incontinence. So consider, again, that the soda can can be disrupted superior and inferiorly based off of treatments. So our point in all of this is to understand where the patient sitting directly in front of you came from. What medical treatments did he or she undergo to survive to be sitting with you right now? How do these treatments affect the patient's musculoskeletal system amongst all the other systems involved? Now we are going to go over practical applications. Okay, this chart depicts how strength is determined, not only in skeletal muscles, but also specifically the respiratory and pelvic diaphragm muscles. As you can see, there are non-invasive and invasive methods for assessing muscle strength. When strength testing, it's important to consider the pattern of muscle recruitment and quality of movement. If there are sensory deficits impacting strength, how deficits will impact the soda can and intrathoracic intra-abdominal pressures. And in addition to determining strength and power, what is the endurance of these muscles? All these factors related to strength influence one's ability to perform functional tasks. So how do we screen for pelvic floor muscle dysfunction? First, was the patient catheterized? Does the patient experience bladder or bowel leakage with a cough or maybe on the way to the bathroom or maybe just any time? Sensation of leakage may or may not be present or maybe they report difficulty emptying their bladder or bowels or they report bladder or bowel frequency or urgency. Or is the patient reporting new onset sexual dysfunction? This would be more likely heard in the home health and outpatient settings. In looking at the pelvic floor, conditions are determined according to how the strength and function of these muscles present. So normally, pelvic floor muscles contract strong and relax completely. If underactive, pelvic floor muscles cannot contract or are weak. And if overactive, pelvic floor muscles do not relax. Additionally, muscles can be non-functioning. This is when the pelvic floor muscle action is not palpable. And those in this category in particular would most likely require treatment of a pelvic health specialist in physical therapy. We're gonna focus on what occurs with underactive and overactive pelvic floor muscles when considering the post-COVID patient. As mentioned earlier, the pelvic floor muscles are similar to a sling or hammock anterior, posterior, and side to side. This picture depicts pelvic floor dysfunction. So question, would this hammock of pelvic floor muscles represent an overactive 
or an underactive pelvic floor diaphragm? Right, underactive. Here anteriorly near the pubic bone, we see damage, possibly damage to the bladder neck, but pelvic floor dysfunction doesn't necessarily mean that something is torn, but there's a breach in the integrity of the sling or the hammock of muscles within the pelvis. Trauma or damage can occur anywhere within the pelvic floor. So for example, think of repetitive coughing. For some, they may have a history of years of repetitive coughing due, be, due to uh, COPD or allergies. And for others, it might be more short term related to their current or recent illness with COVID-19. Another example of repeated strain on the pelvic floor could be from years of straining because of constipation. So imagine the COVID or post-COVID patient who is coughing with a pre-existing condition, such as an older woman who has had several pregnancies and childbirths. It's imperative that we recognize this will have an impact on one's pelvic floor muscles and thus the soda can, which we rely on for regulating pressures within the abdominal and thoracic cavities. So repeated strain on the pelvic floor can take a toll on the integrity of the pelvic floor muscles, ligaments, tendons, and fascia. Another consideration that can't be ignored in someone who's experienced COVID-19 is the tone or flexibility of the muscles. Whether we're talking about one muscle group or several, let's consider how this would influence pelvic floor muscle function. If the muscles are not normal, they could be underactive. So deconditioned muscles resulting from prolonged bed rest could result in incontinence. Or repeated coughing results in repeated downward force, force on the pelvic floor muscles. Consider the deconditioned patient or depressed patient sitting in a slouched posture who isn't getting good excursion of their respiratory and pelvic diaphragm muscles. Or the aphonic patient with vocal cord trauma who's attempting to vocalize by increasing intra-abdominal pressure. This pressure on a weakened pelvic floor could result in urinary or fecal incontinence. Or the muscles could be overactive or more rigid. This is common in some patients with neurologic conditions, including stroke. It too can result from excessive strain from coughing or could occur because of psychological reasons, such as anxiety or fear related to their diagnosis of COVID, maybe being in the hospital or living alone, or maybe they're a fear, their fear of their ability to be able to catch their breath. Tense muscles have a hard time strengthening and functioning effectively. Think how these muscles of the pelvic floor diaphragm relate similarly to the respiratory diaphragm. As with the respiratory diaphragm, we need to consider if there is excess tension and how we promote relaxation. What tools could you use? Maybe altering our tone of voice or providing manual therapy. Ultimately, treatment for underactive muscles involves activating pelvic floor muscle recruitment and treatment for overactive muscles involves calming the autonomic nervous system and relieving that excess tension. One of the purposes of the pelvic floor is to provide support and this docked boat analogy nicely depicts this. The water represents the pelvic floor. Strong pelvic floor muscles provide good support of the pelvic and abdominal organs. Weak pelvic floor muscles result in a strain on the ligaments and the fascia, and this also occurs with excess bearing down force on the pelvic floor and when there's excessive intra-abdominal pressure. So an example of when this might occur would be when one is holding their breath while performing transfers. Not always, but patients surviving COVID may be more likely to have underactivity due to deconditioning from prolonged bed rest and catheterization. And you can see here, if the pelvic floor muscles aren't strong enough to counteract the bladder pressure, then urinary incontinence can occur. And the same could happen with fecal incontinence or inability to control flatus. These are other conditions that are related to pelvic floor muscle weakness and underactivity. 
So consider how increased intra-abdominal pressure influences a patient's function. During a cough, the abdominal pressure increases, thus compressing the contents of the bladder and bowel. And long-term repeated coughing or straining, like with constipation, interferes with the stability of the soda can and the core. And urinary and fecal catheters also promote pelvic floor muscle weakness. So a weakened pelvic floor will have difficulty doing its share of managing intra-abdominal pressure control. Managing the breath with the pelvic floor must be considered during rehab interventions since intra-abdominal pressure impacts poor stability and function. Remember, the pelvic floor during rehab of the COVID survivor to maximize the success of your interventions. So for instance, with bed mobility and transfers, many are gonna to wanna to bear down to hold their breath as they're trying to transfer. And we wanna encourage them to, to breathe through it, but also sometimes we're advising them to lean forward and shift over their center, shift their, uh, center of gravity over their base of support. And this is gonna add additional pressure on their bladder, and if it's full, they might be afraid of leaking urine. So we can cue the patient to contract their pelvic floor during these transitional movements while encouraging them to breathe the entire time and then relax and repeat as needed throughout the transfer. In order to maximize respiratory muscle strengthening, one needs to have an efficiently functioning and strong pelvic floor diaphragm. So recognize how a patient might limit their efforts when performing respiratory exercises if they're afraid of leaking during treatment. And in patients with neurologic conditions such as stroke and gang and beret, this can further compromise their pelvic floor function if it's not addressed in their plan of care. So now consider how performing therapy and activities of daily living can further be challenging if somebody's wearing a mask or if they're obese. So our interventions need to impact the patient in a way that maximizes their oxygen and pressure regulation to gain that core stability that they need for movement. <clears throat> so how do we instruct a patient in the correct way to perform a pelvic floor muscle contraction, sometimes referred to as a Kegel? We can advise them to think of squeezing and lifting as if stopping the flow of urine or the stopping the passing of gas. For males, they can think of retracting the penis and lifting the scrotum, while females can think of lifting vaginally up and in. Of note, there's a study done in 2013 that showed that more than 30% of women with pelvic floor muscle dysfunction were unable to correctly contract their pelvic floor muscles even after individualized instruction with feedback. Common errors, are that people will bear down instead of lifting up and in. And also they might use additional muscles such as the hip adductors, the gluteals, or abdominal muscles uh, in trying to, in attempting to contract the pelvic floor muscles. So we know that for best results, patients do well with supervised pelvic floor physical therapy training. So how do we combine the synchronous motion of the respiratory and pelvic diaphragms? One way is to teach a patient to re remember the letter E, exhale during effort. So the patient would gently inhale, they would contract their pelvic floor while exhaling, and then advise them to relax their breath and their pelvic floor. And when ready, inhale, contract the pelvic floor while exhaling, and repeat the process. It's helpful to have them do this in their own time because it helps to reduce anxiety and to enhance their learning. So as with all skeletal muscles, the pelvic floor has both slow and fast twitch fibers. The slow twitch are activated during transfers and ambulation. The fast twitch are activated just prior to a cough to avoid incontinence. So when teaching a patient how to strengthen their pelvic floor muscles, we often incorporate training of both fiber types by asking them to perform holds as well as quick flick contractions. They might perform these exercises a few times a day 
eight to 12 repetitions each. If a patient is attempting to enhance their cough, it's important that we remind them to keep an upright posture and also if they can uh, pre-contract their pelvic floor and abdominal muscles, that will assist in its efficiency or effectiveness. So consider the influence of posture. Slouching often results from weakness, fatigue, low drive, lack of awareness. Um, so it's important that we encourage an upright and open posture, whether they're sitting or standing, and this will help to activate the spinal extensors. And it allows for contraction of the pelvic and respiratory diaphragms, improved rib expansion, respiratory ventilation, as well as pressure regulation. And then in looking forward, how we would advance these therapeutic interventions, we'd want to incorporate the transverse abdominis and get that activated by first helping the patient find their transverse abdominis, add that to the breath, exhaling during the contraction, and then um, we want to incorporate it into their function. And by doing this, this will enhance breathing. It'll help to manage the intra-abdominal pressure, reduce incontinence, and again, enhance that core stability that's needed during movement and function. So when do we refer to a pelvic health physical therapist? Well, first of all, pelvic health physical therapist is somebody who specializes in the treatment of male and female pelvic dysfunction. And if your patient is reporting that they're having urinary leakage or bowel leakage, or maybe bladder or bowel urgency or frequency, or they're reporting constipation, additionally abdominal or pelvic pain. And that would be any pain between the ribs and the mid thighs. Um, and sexual pain as well, um, oftentimes can be a result of pelvic floor dysfunction. And the way you would find a pelvic health physical therapist is by going to the APTA's Academy of Pelvic Health Physical Therapy's website, aptapelvichealth.org. And in the upper right-hand corner is a link titled Find a PT. You would just add in the geographic location and the pelvic condition and specialist names and location, as well as the contact information appears. So take home points. After surviving COVID-19, patients are being discharged from hospitals at a quicker rate. Patients are likely to follow up with physical therapists to assist in regaining their strength, endurance, balance, as well as quality of life. It's important for physical therapists to screen for risk factors and identify deficits in all the systems of both men and women, including the genitourinary system. Coordination of the respiratory and pelvic diaphragms is necessary to enhance breathing, prevent incontinence, and to maximize function. And addressing the respiratory and pelvic floor diaphragm interplay is critical, not only in patients post-COVID, but all patients. So attached, we've selected some references that you can utilize if you want to investigate this further. And we'd really like to extend our appreciation to the cardiovascular pulmonary section for inviting us to participate in this PACER project and for the American, or I'm sorry, for the Academy of Public Health Physical Therapy support. Thank you so much and stay safe.